Ownership is an essential phenomenon in different firms. Studies suggest that ownership matters for company performance too. Committed owners are more goal-oriented and active owners. Ownership has legal, economic and psychological dimensions. Companies can utilize ownership in different ways. Next, we hear a story of an entrepreneur who sheds light on the choices that their entrepreneurial team did regarding the ownership structure, stewardship ownership model and how multiple governance roles work in their company in practice. This speech was given in the Innovating Social Entrepreneurship Education Seminar in September 2022. Why did ShareTribe Entrepreneurial Team choose the stewardship ownership model and what does it mean to them? All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Antti. I come from a company called ShareTribe and I came to share a story uh, of ownership, ownership structures, more particularly about uh, something called steward ownership, which was um, something I, I didn't hear in our, my university studies uh, and uh, we learned on the way. So I share a little bit what's the steward ownership uh, model, why it could be interesting for uh, social enterprises, especially, hopefully also for many others, as I believe there is a, it holds a great potential to nudge the capitalism to, to a better direction. And um, well, in our uh, studies, we mainly learned about more traditional uh, models of ownership that, and that's how we started our company 10 years ago, quite directly from university. And uh, now I'm very happy to spread the word that there are alternative options. And we have been doing some pioneering work of how to use this particular model in Finland. Maybe actually I ask, uh, there was some interesting news coming up a uh, couple of weeks ago about Patagonia, the outdoor uh, manufacturer. How many heard about their big transition? Some, couple, three, yeah. So um, there was this uh, huge company, multi-billion company, where the owner decided to uh, donate the ownership of the company, but th he actually didn't make it only a charitable organization. He split the shares so that there is another organization deciding, uh, having the decision-making power, but not getting the profits. And there is a charitable organization getting all the profits and investing them in the planet friendly initiatives, but they are not deciding what actually happens. And this is kind of a particular example of the principles of steward ownership, which can be implemented in many ways. But Patagonia is uh, one very recent example of a big company doing this. But I want to share how also small companies can do it. You don't need to be on the Patagonia size uh, to lock in the company to be serving the purpose in long term. And briefly, uh, so that you get the context of what we do, uh, ShareTribe uh, does software that helps entrepreneurs run marketplace businesses, online platforms, where uh, demand and supply meet each other. I show a few examples, uh, but I start with the very first one we did over 10 years ago at the Otaniemi University, current Aalto University campus. We basically built, as a part of a research project, we built a website where people could sell their own course books and computers and ask ask for small favors or people to practice mathematics or rent their student apartments. So it became like a local community marketplace. And with that project, we applied to Startup Sauna, the very first batch of this incubator. And I wanted to bring this up also as a comment about the importance of um, education about social enterprises, because Startup Sauna, while being a very good uh, incubator, it was also very oriented towards the Silicon Valley uh, style high growth venture capital funded, uh, unicorn seeking startups. So that was the example, that was the role model that we got uh, in the beginning. And then we only later heard about other role models. Um, another question for the audience actually, how many have heard about the Zebra movement or the Zebras Unite? Not anyone. Well, I can uh, highly recommend to check it out. It started with a post in the Medium, which was titled, uh, zebras fix what unicorns break. And it refers to the uh, quite known, I think unofficial slogan of the early days Facebook, where it is at, l at least rumored that Mark Zuckerberg said that we need to move fast and break things. And that was kind of the spirit of many 
Silicon Valley startups that let's just try things and let's raise a lot of funding and do bold things and break things also on the way. Kind of encouraging the kind of like um, sometimes careless experimentation which can lead to good, good things as well. But if that's the only role model, it's, it's not so great. So there are a group of entrepreneurs who thought that instead of this kind of a mythical unicorn-like creatures, we could have the role model of the zebras, which are more like a down to the earth, actually existing, working in, in uh, herds, dazzles of zebras, instead of trying to be the only one on top of the mountain. So there is a lot of good, good material online. Uh, zebras Unite, if you Google that, you'll, you'll find, I think, uh, the movement. Um, yeah, so when we learned about that, that was about around 2017. It was ar around the same time when we learned about this alternative uh, ownership models. Uh, but I'll go a little bit back in the story so you know why it was so important for us to find new role models. Because when we started, it was about the same time as the rise of the sharing economy or the platform economy. Uh, startups like Airbnb, uh, Uber and Lyft uh, and Etsy, well, Lyft is kind of a competitor for Uber, but many kind of platforms were popping up which were making it easier to use underutilized resources like apartments or cars, or like Etsy, well, it's a marketplace for handicrafts makers to sell their handicrafts online worldwide without needing to set up their own web shop. So, very helpful ideas originally, and we thought that sharing economy is great. Uh, it helps people to save money and earn money because they can sell their creations or they can uh, buy used goods or they can buy services uh, from the neighborhood. And at the same time, it helps to save the environmental resources because the assets are used more efficiently and recycling is enhanced by these platforms. And as the third benefit, people get to meet each other. Uh, it's not always necessary to go to the faceless corporations to get a service, but you can find things from your neighborhood through this kind of platform. So, we were super excited, uh, freshly out, out from the university, and we wanted to help the whole world share by turning what we built in a research project into a customizable marketplace platform uh, that our customers could use to build their own marketplaces. And today there are already uh, over 1,000 marketplaces around the world. And our team has grown to 23 members, about 2 million in annual revenue. And two last years uh, we have been slightly on the positive side. So it grew, grew out to be actu an actual business as a spin-off from a research project originally. And it has helped the uh, world to share uh, on some extent already. Uh, some examples to get more concrete. Um, for example, in Australia, uh, they've built a marketplace for hiring trailers, which are often quite underutilized assets. In Central Europe, uh, there is a site called Nomadi, uh, built with shared right, where you can find a private camping spots for your camper vans. Or there are uh, marketplaces for used children equipment or for indigenous people in the USA to sell uh, their original handicrafts. Or finding tutors, massagers, cleaners, different kind of very specific niche marketplaces that our customers are creating. But in this process, uh, which we started enthusiastically, we started to ask that, is it really beneficial to the society? because we started to see a lot of the other side of the platform economy, especially the geek economy. There are many terms for the same phenomena. And what we noticed that often the companies had a very noble original promise, which then turned out to be slightly different after they raised a lot of funding. They sold in the process a lot of shares with voting power going outside the original founders, or they made the company public when the decision-making power also goes to the Big, bigger public, basically. For example, Airbnb started with uh, getting the underutilized assets and the empty homes into better use, which was great. And then at some point it started to be that people bought the houses in touristic locations and the prices started uh, going up because the houses were mainly used for Airbnb use and the original um, habitants maybe needed to move away from the city centers because the prices were rising so much. And uh, basically Airbnb could do something about it, but because um, of the ownership structure, there was no easy way to start optimizing for that kind of purpose because the profit maximization took priority. With Uber, also a great promise. You don't need your own car. People with cars can take you and you can very conveniently get a ride from your app. Uh, however, uh, 
there are a lot of problems you've probably heard about the wage levels of these drivers and how they are controlled only by the company which has a huge uh, pressure to pay back to the massive investments it has taken and there is actually according to some research more not less congestion in the cities because drivers are driving around trying to get their earning done trying to find passengers again no big uh, financial incentive for for uber to change that and final example etsy as i said uh, started as the handicrafts uh, only unique handmade items they uh, were certified b Corpor corporation uh, public benefit corporation uh, very mission driven originally and after uh, li getting listed on the stock market a uh, couple of years few changes in the management uh, they got rid of the uh, limiting b corporation uh, status and uh, it welcomed the factory made products already on the marketplace as it was good good for the business so we noticed something common here that despite the noble starting uh, maybe individual uh, like idealistic founders things started to change when the ownership structure started to change and we were wondering how we could get the benefits of the sharing economy uh, the economic environmental and social benefits without the clear downsides as there was a lot of concentration of wealth it wasn't actually enabling people to become their own micro entrepreneurs or it was but it wasn't a fair game in most cases or it isn't a fair game in most cases and uh, it leads to precarization of work uh, bypassing several labor laws etc and it's it's um, actually deepening the class divide in most cases how it is today and uh, we noticed that many of these are related to the ownership structure so the ownership really matters when starting a company or even if you started it you can still change which is part of our story where I get to soon but this led us to change our mission uh, because we realized that most of these big platforms they needed to take huge amount of capital investments in order to build their tools build the apps build the servers build, build everything that enabled and get the more, uh, get the people on the platform with a convenient tool so if we could shift our mission so that the ownership could be more democratic also teams with less capital could have access to this kind of software tools they could build the platforms with the less taking less uh, capital in selling less of the decision power outside maybe instead of only seeing these giant platforms we could see a more uh, diverse field of marketplaces where NGOs and social enterprises and maybe even cities um, could build their own marketplaces locally and keep the economy uh, keep the economy that runs through the marketplaces benefiting the people who do the work there and and the local um, economy as well so this got us again very excited that uh, we can help uh, marketplaces to avoid getting in this trap of uh, selling decision making while raising funding but the good ca question came in uh, because we were a software company we needed to build the platform we needed a lot of capital to do the hard parts of the software even if we could help put it threshold lower for others so what would prevent us uh, from with the next financing rounds selling um, uh, the decision making outside the uh, company or that someday the investors would need to cash out and we would need to put the company public or sell it and we wouldn't couldn't know what the next owners would do so maybe they would start to squeeze everything out from these platforms and this question then eventually uh, about five years ago led us to discover alternative models like okay what could we do this is a really good question it's not like the Airbnb or uh, Etsy founders uh, planned this kind of future probably where they are now going uh, at least we have heard I don't know about these specific examples but about many who kind of gradually slip into selling a bit and bit of the company while, while they raise the funding that they need but this led us to learn about steward ownership uh, which in Finnish we called vastu omistajuus and there the idea is actually it's not very new new idea but it's quite new term a group called purpose in central europe has been researching um, different uh, ownership models and trying to answer this question what could we do because the default model leads to profit maximizing companies eventually could we find a kind of a middle ground solution that prioritizes purpose instead of profit and what would be the tools there and they learned that there actually are already examples like uh, several 
foundation-owned companies seem to do like a good middle ground uh, solution. One example being Bosch that many knows from car parts to home appliances. The owner back in the day decided that instead of giving the company as inheritance to their children, uh, they kept small part for the children uh, to kind of safeguard the future of the family, but majority of the decision-making power was donated into a foundation. So the foundation's uh, purpose is not to maximize the profit, but instead manage the company well and uh, in invest the profit in good causes. So they notice there are examples. Also from Denmark, there is a concept called commercial foundation, like um, Carlsberg is one example. We know it as a beer company, but it actually has a commercial foundation. So it's not like a, a primarily a for-profit company in the traditional sense. So they spot that there are several good examples already, but not many people know about them. So let's spread the word. Let's also make uh, it easier to become this kind of company without being in the scale of uh, Bosch or Zeiss or Patagonia or Carlsberg. And uh, they started to distill what's, what's the essentials here? What are the principles that companies should fill? And principle number one is self-governance. So often when the governance, when the decision-making power is so sold overseas, then it leads to this kind of absentee ownership. So the people who call the shots are actually people who are in for the monetary gain. So it can happen overnight when the company is sold to someone who sees it as a good investment, or it can happen step by step when with new financing round, always a little bit more of the decision power goes to the investors. But if that stays within the people who actually do the work, who actually see the effects of their work, then that leads to better governance for all the stakeholders. Because the further it is uh, from the actual action, the more it goes just to numbers came and profit maximization. And there is another pr principle, uh, not only the one, first one will guarantee uh, uh, prioritizing uh, purpose over profit. So the second principle is that the purpose is the main thing and profits are more like means to an end. So there are technical uh, limitations to how much of the profits can be uh, divided or dealt out from the company. Uh, to people who are making the decisions or people who invested money or their time. It's still possible, but it requires uh, negotiation of what is enough. And I think this is one of the key things here it, it, in this model that it requires people to sit down and ask what is enough. Like if I start a company, what, what would be do I want to become rich? Uh, does it need to be kind of open-ended ticket that if I sell this with 10 million or 100 million, then I get super rich? Or could it be enough that, okay, I can get 1 million or 2 million? Or what would I be happy with? And then there can be agreements of dealing something out from the company to the early risk takers. But then after that, all the profits are serving the purpose. So after that, the company looks a lot like a non-profit organization. Uh, but it still plays with the same playing field as the for-profit organization. So it can use the capital instruments it can take in funding. It, it can reward people who take risks also financially. So it's kind of a middle ground solution trying to take best of the both worlds. Naturally, that's often quite hard to really take all, all the best of the both worlds. But I think for many cases, this can be a really, really good middle ground solution. And I'll go to a bit further details of how we implemented these two principles. And um, well, one thing regarding the first principle, self-governance, is that the voting shares, we split the voting shares and the shares that can earn any capital gains from the company. And the voting shares can only be held by the active team members. So that guarantees there is no absentee ownership, but the actual decision making happens there. So investors still can own shares, but they don't have direct voting power with those shares, which typically is always with the default model that the decision making power goes hand in hand with the shares. And because of this rule, basically the company can't be sold uh, to someone who is not working on the company or it can't be taken uh, public in the traditional sense. Some steward owned companies have some of their shares in public stock market, but the majority of the decision making power still remains within uh, the people 
uh, who, who work there or are uh, concretely linked to the actions, so the stewards of the company. And the profit distribution and salaries are capped. So uh, for the early employees, founders, investors, there is a known cap, how much capital gains they can get as a reward for their risk. And if we pay all that back someday, then there will be no more. Then all the rest will go uh, to the uh, purpose and mission. And a final important thing is that because all the decision power goes with voting rights, the team could decide overnight that, OK, this was a nice thing, but let's change back to the old rules and let's sell the company after all. So the final thing, which kind of locks in this model, is, is making this permanent. We don't have a legal structure for steward-owned companies, at least not yet. So there is kind of hacking the current system. So we are officially normal uh, limited liability corporation in, in uh, Finland, Osake uh, Yhtiö. But we have this kind of hack that I go in a bit more detail that uh, there is a foundation that owns part of the shares which prevents us from moving back. And this way we can give a binding promise to all the stakeholders that we will never sell out. We don't turn back, we don't turn the jacket overnight and uh, abandon the purpose. And then we needed to do a little bit of work to get this work in the Finnish system. Uh, we kind of modeled uh, the papers, the Articles of Association from Germany, a German example, and came up with a structure that, that works well here. And as far as I know, we're the first Finnish company to do it with this model. Uh, but there could be similar principles with some uh, family-owned companies, for example. And we're happy to share our model. We have actually sent our uh, shareholder agreement and articles of association to quite many people as an example, so that there would be less reinventing the wheel required. And the purpose uh, in Central Europe is also collecting examples of different companies, how they have done this. So it's not like a one model fits all. It's more like a custom shoes for different kind of cases, uh, which fulfill these two, two principles of self-governance and uh, profits serving the purpose. The important thing is the division of the voting shares uh, and profit shares. So the voting shares, they don't have any uh, profit rights, which helps people to decide without trying to get more money in their own pocket. And the profit shares, they don't have voting rights. So people can take financial risk, they can be rewarded, but then they are not there uh, taking part of the, on the uh, decision making. And um, I go maybe quite fast with the details, but you can ask, ask me later. Um, basically, we split these also two, uh, two classes. A shares are the shares held by the active team members and making the decisions in the annual general meeting. And the B share is needed to make this structure permanent. So there is one share that is required for changing the rules. And the purpose foundation is something uh, done for this purpose. And the rules of the foundation is to safeguard the steward ownership structure. So they will vote against any rule changes that would dismantle the steward ownership. So that's kind of the hack here, how, how we make this permanent. Um, then on the profits side, everyone who invested money has C shares. Uh, so they're held by the investors. And uh, when we have been raising funding, we have pre-agreed what is the price with which we buy back the shares from the investors. Uh, so those who invested in our biggest fundraising in 2018, the promise was that we buy them back with five times the price. So they know what is the maximum they can get. We don't pay any dividends but the time may vary. So we need to be, do some profit. And after profitable years, we have capital that we can use uh, for those buybacks. And then because there were uh, us founders and the early employees, some advisors who got their um, uh, compensation as shares or options, which is the typical Silicon Valley style system, we needed to convert from that system to the system where everything is pre-negotiated. So we also negotiated what are the value, what, what will be the sum with which we buy back these D shares, which are like the delayed compensation for those. And there again, we need to discuss with the whole team what would be enough. And we ended up going um, quite deep there, but eventually found a good, good solution. And with this model, we shifted in uh, 2018 and we were wondering, can we really raise funding with these kind of limitations? Will we find enough investors? 
and we did a crowdfunding with some angel investors, um, one uh, fund, no traditional VCs, and then a lot of individual investors. So uh, overall, more than 400 people invested. Um, a lot of them were familiar with ShareTribe in one form or, or another earlier. And then we used part of these um, gains from this fundraising to buy back most of the shares from the earlier investors, which were traditional VCs and which uh, had a bit hard time converting into this model. But we were able still four years ago to kind of shift paths, take another course, prioritize the purpose, uh, make a financial arrangement that uh, made everyone happy or at least uh, content with the, with the arrangement. And now approaching the end, I briefly summarized the, some of the pros and cons we've noted with the past four years riding with this system. So this does rule out some financing options. We can't raise money from the traditional venture capital uh, funds and some angel investors also don't want to invest with this. Some angel investors, however, are very excited about some, someone doing something in a new way and want to promote this kind of movement. So it's a choice. Uh, also, with, if we want to hire a new high-level manager or board members, uh, they might expect some options or typical stock, stock um, and e or equity. We can't do that in a traditional sense, but we can have a other kind of rewards uh, with some limitations. And our own payoff is limited, but as, again, we could negotiate what is enough. Then on the pro side, uh, now we're able to give a binding promise uh, to all shareholders. Our team when recruiting, this has been a good, really, really good thing to highlight. And also for customers who don't want to start their platform on a startup that might be sold overnight or might change completely or might, might disappear. So this gives a lot of security also that we are in this game for long term and that we can control our own destiny. The investors can't force any decision on us. It aligns nicely the incentives for the whole team and also the investors when at the moment of investment, they know what they sign up for. And overall, I feel that this not just capitalism to great direction, like if more companies would do this kind of setup, set the limits to something that is enough for those who take risks and then focus on the purpose, uh, the game field would look quite different. So I would summarize that for us, the pros are clearly bigger than the downsides. And I believe this could be the case for many other, other companies as well. So I thank you here and uh, hope this has given some inspiration towards thinking the ownership structure uh, before you go too far in, in starting your social enterprise or any kind of enterprise. And if you're interested to uh, hear more about the steward ownership or the details, I'll, I'll be very happy to share our papers and discuss the model. So feel free to reach out or ask any questions now. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's the important thing, which I hope that is also included from here to the social entrepreneurship education to mention the options, because at least my awareness when we started was that, okay, there can be for-profit or non-profit options, but then that there can be this kind of middle ground. Yeah. And they are easier to set up if done in the early phase. We had a bit of struggle uh, when shifting, uh, but also that's possible. And, uh, yeah. Did you feel that you get, um, when you uh, participated in startup sauna, sauna uh, how much like uh, talk there was about ownership? Did you get a lot of like uh, advice from there for ownership issues? That's a good question. It's a long time ago, I think 2010 when we were there, so I don't remember the detail. The biggest detail I, I remember this kind of anecdotal story, but it was there was a lawyer talking about um, contracts and like uh, non-disclosure agreements and how to protect the secrecy. And we were kind of a uh, bit, bit rebellious. They were kind of annoyed with the, all the difficulties. And we ended up thinking how transparently we could do everything. And we started writing a blog at avoinyritus.fi as a kind of thought experiment. And that, that was something that maybe encouraged us to start the official company. It happened only later. Not so much related to the question, but it's, it's funny how sometimes somebody teaching about something can lead to opposite results. Regarding the ownership structures, I think the default was that, okay, it's this limited liability corporation. And when you raise funding, we discuss, I, as far as I remember, more the different options of raising funding, like if it's direct equity or convertible notes or loan funding or these kind of things. So they affect the ownership, but um, 
we didn't discuss so much what to put in the articles of association. Uh, so we just started with the default articles of association. So every company in Finland needs to have those. And in the corporate law, it says that the, the purpose of the company is to uh, bring, bring profits to the shareholders unless it's otherwise specified in the articles of association. So the law gives a possibility to define it otherwise, but people when starting, at least when we were starting, we didn't know about this, so we didn't specify anything there. Um, we did have some purpose-related things in our shareholder agreement, which was good. It already helped us to have that when we signed the first investors, that hey, we, we, they were kind of on the same level. We know that we want to do profit and good for the society, but it was only in the shareholder agreement level. So only in 2018 we shifted the Articles of Association, which is a public document. So, so that's a one good reminder also as well, that when you start the company, many people are just, yeah, yeah, just start with the defaults. But, but then if you don't specify anything else, then legally the purpose of the company is to maximize shareholder value. So it's worth paying attention to. And if you don't, you are breaking the law. <laughs> In, in, in a way, I don't know, cases in Finland would have, there have been like court cases yeah. about that, but there is some, something in the USA uh, with, with some car companies, I don't know. If, it's a, if somebody rings a bell, but maybe it was Ford or Chrysler or something, where there was actually a court case about this kind of uh, not prioritizing the shareholder value. And uh, it's a, kind of a not the greatest part of history, because I think it's sometimes used as an example that you must do it. But at least in Finland, you don't need to do it if, if you specify it. And often the shareholders take care of their prioritization anyway, because those who have maturity, then they, in the general meeting, they can be calling the shots. But, uh, but it kind of entitles the board and the CEO to act more freely if that's stated, what, what's stated in the Articles of Association. Thank you.